Hi. Uh, good afternoon. It's my great honor to be here in the Oslo Freedom Forum. Thank you for inviting me. I would like to start by asking you, what is the first uh, word that you have in mind when you think of Mexico? I don't know, it might be mariachis, tequila. I'm sure you think of beautiful beaches. We do have beautiful beaches. But also, I think uh, you might think as well uh, about corruption. And this is important for me because I have experience since I was 20 when I first started to travel around abroad that the world think of Mexico as a very corrupt country. I remember one day in 1995, I was in the US traveling with a Colombian friend and his father from Colombia asked me, so Presidente Carlos Salinas plundered your country, right? And, uh, and then he laughed. And then I thought, yeah, but you are mocking at the Mexican situation? And don't get me wrong, I do admire Colombian literature and the country. But in those years, in the 90s, as you might remember, they were the news, not Mexico. They were the news with these uh, stories of Pablo Escobar, the bombings, the killings. They were the terror for Latin America. I mean, they, the stories of terror were from, from Colombia. But Everything changed in the 90s for Mexico, especially in the 1994, which is the year where the NAFTA begin, began, and it is also the year of our biggest economical, economic crisis. I remember I was a student then, and I was trying to save money for the next semester, and I wanted to be focused in college. I was already working in a newspaper, etc., but I was planning to quit my job and be a student full-time. But I couldn't because the devaluation, it was of 100% of our currency, so that meant that I lost everything in one day. As my family, as my father, as every thousands, hundred thousands of people in my country. And I was really shocked then by understanding how a context, a political, economic context was determined or defining affecting my life, my personal, everyday life. And that's how I, I was already uh, studying journalism, but I was really convinced that if I was going to be a journalist, I was going to tell stories, not just of people or personal stories, but I was trying to connect that personal crisis, tragedies, of stories of crime, impunity, with the context and the system and the institutions that are sustaining this system in my country. And coming from Mexico, I can tell you tons of stories. I can spend the whole day telling you about how this context of crime, drug war, and especially impunity has affected our personal stories. But I would like to talk about one, one story that took place just two weeks ago in my home state, Chihuahua. It happens that a group of kids, 11 years old, 13 years old, and 15 years old, get together to play the kidnappers. And they kidnap while playing, they said, this young kid. The police report said that the kids that killed him beat them to death with stones and thorny sticks, covered the body with a death animal, and abandoned him. The whole country was shocked because of this crime. I was shocked, of course. But I also was asking, why are we shocked? Don't we, don't we expect this from our from these generations after eight years of 100,000 killings with complete impunity, 98% of these killings that have taken place in Mexico remain unsolved. And now we are shocked because the kids are killing, thinking that kill is easy. And I insist, why are we shocked? Don't we see the connection between this wave of criminality and especially, and excuse me if I insist, especially impunity, because the reality of 98% of crime without any explanation speaks of a reality of 
where everybody can kill thinking that it's legal. It's so easy that even kids now are thinking that they can kill and get along with crime as everybody's doing in the country, especially the government. So what do we expect now? We have a, a president living in a house financed by a contractor. And we have a federal attorney office who is now asking us to forget about the disappearance of 43 students in Guerrero, as you might already know. And while trying to make these connections between uh, the environment in, in my country and how the kids are internalized in this violence, I interview a kid who murdered his entire family, if you can imagine this. And he got caught because he was not in the organized crime, which is the crime that police protect. So he was 16 years old. And he and his friends, because he convinced two friends to help him to kill his family, they all said in interviews that they thought that it was going to be easy. And when I interviewed him, I asked him, how come do you think that the kill three people, drive miles with three bodies, and set them in fire? How come that is easy? And this is what he answered me. We really thought that it was a perfect plan. We thought that they would find the bodies, ask some questions maybe, and that that would be it. Everybody will forget. We never thought, what if they found us? What if they caught us? We told ourselves, we are in Mexico, a corrupt country. The cops are only decoration. I mean, we saw Mexico as a complete corrupt, full of impunity. You know how many dead women are in Juarez? That's what he said to me, and that explained to me that the violence that we were witnessing, living, was going to have longer, longer impacts that than, than we, we thought then. How can, we, how can we blame them if uh, crime and impunity is what they say in a, in a daily basis? So that's the value of human life in my country, unfortunately. And this is being absorbed by the public, by kids, because impunity and corruption spreads out from the government, from the top to the bottom, and not other way around. And this is very important for me to point out, because the government is saying, this is cultural, we are all corrupt, and you change first. Don't wait for me to change. And that's not how it works. They, they have to change and make an example to society because they, are, they have the constitutional mandate to apply law. But that's, uh, that's the kind of journalism that I'm trying to do through making these connections of uh, personal stories of suffering with the global, political, economic context that that we are living because we tend to think ourselves as individuals and I, I, I am really concerned that we usually forget that we are connected and that we are a society and a system and that we, we have to understand how it works in order to, to change it, to break it for good. Thank you.